Hello and welcome everyone in the lecture series of Science of Living System. So today's class will deal about the basic aspect of our brain structure and function. As you all probably know, our brain is one of the most sophisticated computational machine. It can change its own hardware and rewire itself into a new configuration whenever it does a new task. For every little memory that we store in our brain, for that, our brain actually forms a completely new circuitry for that specific memory. So our brain is about about three pounds, which is equivalent to one point say four or one point five kilogram weight. That consists about hundred billions of neuron. We'll talk about that in detail. And this hundred billions of neuron are actually interconnected with each other and form a network. And that a specific network actually gives a specific type of behavior. Now we think some of the complex human behavior, like when we cry, when we smile, or even you think when we feel for somebody, what are the neuronal circuitry that are involved in such kind of behavioral phenotype? We really don't know anything about that. So it's you, probably some of you could be interested to solve the mystery of this kind of uh, I mean, puzzle. So, I mean, you being a student of engineering and basic science field, you always probably think, why we have to study science of living system, biological system? Now, we have given several examples. So this is one of the example where you could be inspired the fascinating, some of the fascinating aspect of our brain. One of them, of course, you heard about is the enormous computing power. And the second thing is endless memory. What is the mechanism that our brain actually employ to such unlimited memory or enormous computing power. So you could be interested to, to figure out how it happens. Okay, and your expertise, your expertise in engineering or other basic science field could be able to decipher that mechanism. And someday you might be able to land up your career in this kind of field, okay? Anyway, so let's, uh, start some of the basic, very basic aspect of our brain. Okay. So this is actually showing some of the anatomical, uh, let me start the paint, so some of the basic anatomical areas of our brain that are linked with specific functions. So look at your frontal side, frontal part of your brain, which primarily involved in speech and smell. On the other hand, if you look at your back side of your brain, that is called occipital lobe, which is primarily responsible for our vision. Similarly, there is a temporal lobe, which take part in intellectual and emotional functions. Look at the parietal lobe, which is involved in language and comprehension. And you see in the bottom small part, that's called cerebellum, which is involved in motor coordination, okay? Now, the thing, if you want to see the internal structure of our brain, if we think to find out what are that in your, in, inside your brain, how you can study that? So this way you can actually cut your brain to see the internal structures. So this is one of the way to cut your brain in make a small, small slice. So here you can cut your brain from front to back, or you can think from back to front. By doing this, you can see various internal structures 
you can see this two hemisphere you can see the ventricle like this here is another way you can cut your brain so this is called sagittal sectioning where you can cut your brain from left to right or right to left and by doing so you can also visualize or distinctly see some of the area of your brain that are present inside so one of the area showing here is amygdala which is actually involved in your emotional behavior and back of it you see this part this is actually a hippocampus where our memory is actually stored okay similarly you can even cut off your brain 16 sections from top to bottom and these kind of sectioning are often called horizontal or axial now this three way of cutting section and visualizing the internal part of your brain is clearly depicted in MRI magnetic resonance imaging scan when someone does magnetic resonance imaging scan of their brain it is showing here you can you can scan the image you can take the image in three different ways like here it's axial image so it means that you are taking the image from top to bottom this is a sagittal uh, MRI scan where you can scan the brain from left to right or right to left and this is a actually coronal imaging so you can think you can take uh, the image from front to back and when you combine all three images you can actually visualize almost all the internal part of your brain so now if you have any problem inside your brain by doing this three different kind of scanning you can actually pinpoint okay so that's why the MRI scan is often used to find out any kind of problem inside your brain okay so now let's uh, see what are the this slide actually will tell you what are the structural and functional unit of our nervous system and we all know that's the neuron but do you know how neuron actually first discover as a structural and functional unit of the nervous system. So these are the two guys. So Camilo Golgi, who actually first discovered a method of staining neuron that's called Golgi staining. That's nothing, it's just a simple dye. So he put the small part of the brain in a, in a, in a, in a person dichromate, uh, sorry, silver chromate solution. And if you put a piece of a small brain in silver chromate solution, the cell present in your brain actually darkly stained. And that you can see under microscope. Okay. And by doing so, he actually observed surprisingly, that time nobody was knowing, the cells in your brain actually have enormous branching, which is shown here. And he was actually surprised to see how the cell that was not named, neuron is not actually named how the cells in the brain, in our brain, actually have enormous branchings. And by looking at very simple, his own handmade microscope is depicted here, he come to a conclusion that the two neurons are connected with each other continuously. So the information from one neuron can easily go to the other neuron. There is no discontinuity. They are continuous. It's like a spider web. Okay. During the same time, another Spanish scientist, Santiago Ramon Cajal, he used the same Golgi stain, but he has an extraordinary artistic skill. And by virtue of that, when he observed the image under the light marble microscope, he draw the image. This is actually showing his own hand drawing image. It's a wonderful image. You can see how, how the different branchings, neuronal branchings are so nicely he draw. And by doing, by making such diagrams and from his intuition, he kind of made a conclusion which is absolutely opposite of Golgi's conclusion. So the, the Raymond Kahal says that the two neurons of course are connected but interconnected but there is not a continuous connection so in between there is a gap 
Of course, nobody believed that time. Is there any gap or not? But now we know that Kahal was right. There was a gap. There is a gap, and that gap is now known as synapse. Okay, so that's how the neuron doctrine started. So the neurons in our brain are somewhat different from the other cell of your body, our body, in, in multiple ways. First, it is electrically excitable. Second, uh, of course, uh, so, so the neurons are different from the other cell of your body in two different, at least two different ways. First is electrically excitable. And the second thing is it has a huge number of processings which are known as axons, dendrons. So these both guy actually got Nobel Prize in 1906. And it's clearly written here, they got Nobel Prize, they had been awarded Nobel Prize for revealing the inner beauty of the nervous system. By looking at this picture, you can understand how beautiful inside your brain is. Okay. Now, so this is the typical cartoon picture of the neuron. You can see any textbook. So this is the cell body. This is the dendrons. This is where the tip of dendrons actually receive the signal. And this, the long one is axon. Axon is covered with a thick myelin sheet, which is nothing but a thick lipid layer, which is actually insulator. And in between, there is a small, small gap. That's called actually node of Ranvier. And the, these are the axons. And the, in part of the axons actually form synapse with the dendrites of the other neuron. It can be with dendrite, it can be in the cell body of other neuron, and this is another neuron. So, so the information from one neuron then pass through the other neuron through the typical structure that I just mentioned is called synapse. So in the synapse, there is a gap. So we'll talk much more details about these synapse because these synapse are the place where our memory actually stored, not only that, the dysfunctions of the synapse are actually caused most of the neuropsychiatric disorder today, whatever you can find out. So our root cause is somewhere in the synapse. Now, if you if you if you look at the higher magnification image uh, of the, this this part, okay. Using same Golgi stain, you can you can you can you can stain your brain by using Golgi staining method, and then look at in high power optical microscope that we have talked in some class, different types of microscope. Then you can see this is a cartoon diagram, this straight, but in these areas there are a lot of protrusions, a lot of extended structures, and these are actually written here. These are actually called dendritic spines. So a small part of the axon can have hundreds, thousands of such dendritic spines and where actually synapse formed with other neuron. So if you now can think if we have a hundred billions of neuron in our brain, there could be hundred trillions of synapse. Okay, so that we have to remember. So this is just uh, the Golgi staining method. This is actually a little bit modified version. Uh, rather than the Golgi's own method is self-explanatory. You can easily read and find out how it can be done. So now we will try to understand how the nerve impulse is generated within the neuron and how it can travel across the neuron. And later we will talk how the information from one neuron goes to other neuron through the synapse. So let's first think how the nerve impulse is generated within the neuron. So now think all the neurons, like any other cells, always maintain a normal resting potential. So neuron at normal conditions have a typical potential, that's the electrical potential difference across its cell membrane, that's called resting membrane potential, and that usually varies from minus 60 to minus 70 millivolt. Okay, so now if you look at the, the typical neuronal membrane here, this is the outside and this is the inside. Inside means in the cytosolic, in the cytosolic uh, side. So the outside of the neuronal membrane is positively charged. Net charge is the positive because of higher concentration of sodium ion. While the inside, the net charge 
charge is slightly negative because of the presence of protein and different phosphate groups, phosphate ions. Okay, and uh, there are many channels that are located in the membrane. See, potassium leak channel, sodium leak channel. They spontaneously causes the leakage of sodium and potassium ions, so the ion can easily go through it from outside to in or inside to outside. And there is also a specific another specific channel which is called sodium potassium ATPH. This is very, very important. This play a very, very important role. Whenever there is a disturbance of the sodium and potassium ion, ion around this, across this uh, two sides of the membrane, this actually try to compensate for sodium and potassium ion leakage. And we have to also remember 70% of the energy requirement of our brain, our nervous system actually used to operate this kind of pump, okay? So now, at least this slide, you understand the normal neuron, there is a resting membrane potential, and that varies about minus 60 to minus 70 millivolt. And the minus sign is because the inner surface of the cell, neuronal cell or neuronal membrane, is actually having negative charge. That's why it's indicated. So now the question is how the, 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 the information is received the tip, from the tip of the neuron and the potential is generated or information is uh, started, a, a signaling process begins, okay? So when a neuron is stimulated by other chemicals, it can be light, or it can sound or mechanical disturbance, there is a generation of local potential, the tip of this neuron, which receives the signal. Okay, so the receptor types could be different. So I already mentioned, it could be chemicals. If you think about your tongue, you, if you get different kind of taste. It can be sour, sweet, uh, whatever it is. And these tastes are actually because there's in the taste bud, there are specific types of receptors located. The chemicals that causes those different kind of taste, they actually go binds with the specific type of receptor and the receptor get activated. Once the receptor get activated, the sodium ion goes in. The influx of sodium, influx means entry. Entry of sodium ion takes place. That actually causes formation or generation of local potential. So in the case of say vision, light impulse, the light signal actually hits in your retina and there are photoreceptor in your eyes which can change light signal to electrical signal. So light actually causes generation of local potential in your retina. Similarly, in case of hearing, the sound wave actually causes generation of local potential in the cochlea, in the, co in the hair cell that is located in your cochlea in our yard. In our yard. Similarly, if you think about your skin, their touch or temperature, the mechanoreceptor or thermoreceptor, they're present in the tip, the nerve, and, and the tip of your nerve that present in your skin. So they can actually, because of the temperature change or because of the touch, they can generate potential in the tip of it. Okay, so 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 there is a generation of local potential, and that is caused by the presence of specific types of receptor in different neurons, okay? But in general, they does the similar kind of function. That is, once the receptor is activated, it can be either by chemicals, it can be sound, it can be wave, sound wave, it can be light, so on. So they all can cause activation of specific type of receptor, which ultimately leads to entry of sodium ion inside the cell, okay? So that's how the generator potential is created, okay? And then the neurons, once that happens, once sodium ion goes in, neuron, the neuronal membrane actually depolarizes. So now you can think inside of your neuron was negatively charged. Now sodium ion enters inside the cell. So that means the negative charge become gradually goes towards positive. That's why it's called depolarization. So what is next? So we, we just start from here, right? So in normal condition, neuron or under rest, when the neuron under rest, there is resting membrane potential. 
Once uh, the generator potential, you see the depolarization. That's what we talked about in the earlier slide. Now, once the generator potential reached a threshold value, which is about minus 55 millivolt, then there is a sudden shoot up of the depolarization signal. So there is a sudden up and then down. That's called the peak, or often called it's so rapid, it's called the spike and it's also called the action potential. Okay, so that, that is it leading with, I mean, that consists of deep, rapid depolarization phase, followed by rapid repolarization, then hyperpolarization phase. So now you have to understand, once the generator potential or local potential, which is somewhere, say, is coming, say, around here, so all the local potential or generator potential will be generated in different parts of the neuron and dendrites which receive the signal. And then it will come to somewhere here and this is the area where a generator potential can reach to a maximum value. So it may reach to three sole value. So that's the place is called trigger zone. Once the generator potential or local potential reached a three sole value, suddenly shoot up and give rise to action potential. And what is action? So action potential usually is generated in the trigger zone. And then once the action potential is generated, it can travel. We'll talk about that in more details. So then what is the action potential? So the action potential is a rapid up and down shift of the membrane voltage. So this happens so you know up to this uh, up to this generator potential. So generator potential happens because of the entry of the sodium ion, and that entry happens because of the specific type of receptor located in the tip of the dendrites. Okay. But this rapid up and down is because of other channels. We'll talk about that. And that because of voltage gated sodium channel. Okay. That will come later. Now we just try to describe about the action potential. As I told you it's an action potential is a rapid up and down shift in the membrane voltage. It actually has a unique property that is called all or non phenomena. If the local potential or generator potential reached a threshold, then only once it reached threshold, then only neuron fire at its maximum voltage. If threshold is not reached, Neuron does not fire. This is very, very important. So that's called all or non phenomena. One of the characteristics, property of action potential. Okay. Now go to this is actually this slide actually very systematically shows you different event that takes place during generation of action potential. So this is the resting membrane potential and and once uh, a specific type of receptor actually I get activated and there is a generation of local potential of generator potential. And I told you when it reached to threshold value like minus 55 millivolt, then there is sudden deep or rapid depolarization. And how that happened? So in the neuronal membrane, I told you there is another channel that's called voltage gated sodium channel as well as voltage gated potassium channel. Now this voltage gated sodium channel actually gets activated once the membrane voltage reached a threshold that's minus 55 millivolt. So then threshold value, so it needs a specific voltage for its activation. So at threshold value, this voltage gated sodium channel get activated. Once it gets activated, there's a rapid entry influx of sodium ion. Okay. That's what really happens. So one goes in, and that leads because because the inside membrane become very rapidly positively charged, your membrane get depolarized very rapidly. Then you can see the peak is goes like this. Okay. But the interesting thing is this voltage gated sodium channel are very quickly desensitized. Once it get activated, few maybe within microsecond or maybe nanosecond, the receptor get quickly desensitized and its entry grate become closed. It's a moment. And during that time, say voltage might reach say plus 30 millivolt. Okay. So at that time it desensitized, so it cannot depolarize anymore because gate is closed. At this moment and at this voltage, 
the voltage gated potassium channels now open so you can understand to open the voltage gated potassium channel you need much higher voltage okay so at this voltage the voltage gated potassium channel now open and that causes rapid efflux i'm talking about efflux not influx rapid efflux which means rapid out of the potassium ion from inside the cell that leads to the decrease in the positive charge inside the cell so your membrane gets repolarized so your down shift because of the out of the potassium ion so your membrane get repolarized and so you can see here repolarization state continues and after some times and by now your your sodium channels again gets back get back to its normal state so membranes now reach to its own resting state so this is how the 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 the, the sequence this is the sequential event of how axon potent sphere actually generates now one of the interesting thing is because of the rapid desensitization of of voltage gated sodium channel and channels voltage gated sodium channels the 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 informations never goes backwards so informations or 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 that's an important cell always travels forward this direction because it cannot go this direction because the the, the axon the, the, the voltage gated sodium channel now desensitize okay it can activate the another voltage gated sodium channel in this forward way so it can be clear very clear from this picture you just see this is a unmyelinated fiber you can just first think about that so this is where the axon potential is generated okay and this 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 line actually this area actually represents the refractory membrane which is because of the uh, desensitization of voltage gated sodium channel and this is your which is coming back normal resting potential is coming back okay so because of the desensitization the axon potential cannot go back so it always goes forward okay so that's how the axon potential travels in one direction okay that was clear now this is this is we are talking about unmyelinated fiber there is no myelin sheath now what happens if there is a myelin sheath in the axon so just think this is this is this is typical myelin sheath in the axon area if you just see the enhanced higher magnification image this is the myelin sheath and this is the node of ran here right so because of the thick insulated lipid layer where you can't find out any kind of uh, voltage gated sodium or potassium channel they can be only found in this node of ran here so the ionic exchange only can takes place in this node of ran here suppose the axon potential cell is generated here okay next axon potential cell to be generated it can't it cannot be generated here so the sodium ion which is goes in inside can diffuse and come back come to here come forward to this place so during this process definitely concentration of sodium ion may go down but it could be enough if it is reached a threshold value then definitely it will make action potential in this area if it can diffuse and it cannot make uh, it cannot reach threshold so it will not be able to make action potential but if it reaches the threshold then it will definitely make action potential so in this manner so the, the presence of lipid myelinated sheet actually helps to move the action potential much faster it just jump from node to node node to node so obviously speed of the nerve impulse action potential will be much faster in case of myelin sheet so this kind of conduction nerve conduction nerve impulse is often called saltatory conduction so now so, so which means the impulse or nerve impulse speed in myelinated fiber is much faster than unmyelinated fiber now in our central nervous system typically in our brain most of the neurons are actually unmyelinated there is no myelinated neurons inside in your in your, in your brain central nervous system but there are many myelinated neurons you can find in the peripheral system like your hand legs the long axons where you could be able to see lot of myelinated neuron and in those cases your the speed of nerve impulse uh, is always high and that's obvious right because impulse has to come from long i mean from the from the leg it has to reach to brain so long distance so to make it much faster 
you must uh, need uh, myelin sheath for, for this extraneable. Okay. So this is something very interesting to show you. So if you just compare the the speed of nerve impulse in myelinated versus non-myelinated, you can see here in case of myelinated neurons, the speed could be about 80 to 120 miles per second, while in non-myelinated neuron it could be 0.5 to 2 miles per second. It's quite low if you compare with non-myelinated neuron. But once you compare the speed of your nerve impulse with the, with the electricity, you will be amazed to see the nerve impulse speed is about 3 million times slower than the electricity. Which is, which is something very, very surprising for you guys, I'm sure. Okay. Well, different, this, is, this is completely different perspective. So we already talked about voltage-gated sodium channels, right? Now, there are certain fish, when they, they, they bite or they attack you, they, are, they have a poisonous gland. This is a puffer fish. They have a poisonous gland. And the poisonous gland actually releases some toxins, the chemicals. That's named, it's called, it's called tetrodoxy. And this is very, very potent poison. And this tetrodoxin is actually a irreversible, strong blocker of voltage-gated sodium channel. People have told, people have shown that this tetrodoxy is actually it's more poisonous than the potassium cyanide. So that tells you it can kill you instantly. Okay. But uh, you know this this fish is one of the one of the very delicious fish in, in Japan. So if you can carefully remove the poisonous gland, it would it could be very, very delicious, but at the same time it can kill you. But it is one of the most expensive Japanese delicacy. Okay. Now you just think about uh, another uh, blocker, sodium channel blocker, which is called lidocaine. So this is actually most commonly used during, during dental kind of dental surgery or any kind of dental problem you have. When doctor try to see your, your, your tooth, they might sometimes give you a local injection, local anesthetic injection, and that injection actually consists lidocaine. Okay, so. So what it does actually, so lidocaine actually block voltage-gated sodium channel, but in this case, it's very, very weak and reversible. So within one or two hours, you can wash up this, uh, this, this small compound. So the difference between these two, this is strong blocker, reversible blocker that can kill you, while a weak blocker and irreversible blocker that can be used to anesthetize for smaller time and then doctor can do whatever surgery they want and you will not have any sensation because the voltage gated sodium channel is blocked. So action potential cannot travel. So you don't have any kind of sensation in your nerve. The area it will do surgery. Okay. So next time you go to the dental doctor, dentist and if doctor does, I mean does something or inject something, you look at what is he injecting. I'm sure it must be lidocaine or something related to this molecule, okay? So, so we have talked about uh, generation of or, or formation of generator potential and then formation of axon potential somewhere here. It's a trigger zone, then the axon potential travels to the axon and reaches to the end part of the axon. Now the question comes, how this, this axon potential then will go from one neuron to other neuron in, 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 in synapse. So in synapse, you know, there's a gap, small gap. So how the axon potential will travel through this gap? Or in other words, how the information from one neuron will go to other neuron through this synapse process, through the synapse, okay? So there are two guys, two scientists. One is Otto Lewy and Sir Henry Dale. So the landmark discovery of Otto Lee and Henry Dale actually showed that there is some chemicals that is released from the end of this neuron, the initial neuron, or you can say the presynaptic neuron. So if this is synapse, 
this is the this is the first order neuron the first neuron you can talk tell that is the pre synaptic neuron and the the, the sy, where it synapses where it makes synapse of the other neuron that neuron can be called the post synaptic neuron okay so what they found is the when the when the pre synaptic neuron is excited and when the axon potential travels to the end of the pre synaptic neuron it actually releases some chemicals and that's called neurotransmitter or neurochemicals and that neurotransmitter goes binds to the specific receptor present in the post synaptic neuron at the synaptic junction and the binding of the neurotransmitter to the post synaptic receptor will lead to the activation of that receptor followed by the generation of axon potential in the post synaptic neuron that's the summary so this guy actually discover first discover a neurotransmitter that's actually named is acetylcholine so they discovered the first neurotransmitter which is acetylcholine it is also the neurotransmitter we'll talk about it in the nerve muscle junction so there are a lot of other neurotransmitters that can also be secreted from different neurons in the different part of your brain like dopamine serotonin glutamate this the amino acid neurotransmitter you know this is the acidic amino acid gaba and glycine gaba is the gamma amino butyric acid and the glycine most simplest amino acid okay so they all actually act as a neurotransmitter if you see the red color one they are actually called excitatory neurotransmitter which means once the released goes and binds with the post synaptic neuron they can excite they can form action potential in the post synaptic neuron I look at the green one. They are called the inhibitory neurotransmitter. So once uh, the, this kind of uh, this kind of neurotransmitters or neurotransmitter is released in the synaptic uh, in the synapse, and they goes binds to the postsynaptic membrane, they can inhibit. They can inhibit the excitation of the postsynaptic neuron. That's why they called inhibitory neurons. Okay. So both of these guys got Nobel Prize in 1936. okay uh, by discovering the chemical transmission of the nerve impulse especially the transmission of nerve impulse through this synaptic region so now we'll talk much more details about this synaptic structure and synaptic transmission so this is a cartoon can easily very easily you can understand from this cartoon picture so you know that axon potential travels through the axon right and reaches the end part so the end part you can say the pre synaptic terminals or it's often called synaptic knobs so that the pre synaptic terminals actually reach in not only the voltage gated cation calcium channel present in the membrane there is also lots of small small vesicle that are filled with neurotransmitters so you can think about they could be filled with acetylcholine they could be filled with dopamine serotonin glutamate gaba and so on okay so now think the axon potential once it reaches to the end part of the pre synaptic neuron there at that place it is actually highly enriched with voltage gated calcium channel so you have to remember in this area you have much more concentration of voltage gated calcium channel and once axon potential reached in this area this channel get activated and because of their activation there are lot of calcium ion goes in so there is a influx of calcium ion and the entry of calcium ion that's the second stage can lead to this vesicles to come close contact with the pre synaptic membrane fuse and see the fourth stage they can fuse the process is called exocytosis and after fusion all the chemicals neurochemicals and neurotransmitter can be released and the vesicle can be recycled and go back to its normal place on the other hand the released neurotransmitter can go and binds with the specific receptor present in the post synaptic neuron this is the post synaptic neuron and this is the receptor So the goes binds to the specific receptor present in the post synaptic neuron, and once they goes and binds, they can activate those receptor. And once this receptor get activated, there is an entry of sodium ion. We'll talk about more details about that. 
and that ultimately leads to generation of action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. And that's how the information can travel from one neuron to another neuron. So this is just a flowchart how systematically describe how the synaptic transmission can take place stepwise. The one thing that is main, not mentioned here is that the, the neurotransmitter actually released from the presynaptic neuron in a quantized manner. So what is quanta? So quanta is the, the content of the neurotransmitter in a single vesicle. Okay. The amount of neurotransmitter that will be released from the presynaptic neuron depends on the, the, the magnitude of action potential. If the signal strength is very strong, you could expect more release of uh, neurotransmitter or also how long the, the presynaptic neurons are firing. So all of them can have influence on the release of neurotransmitter from the presynaptic end. So next we will talk about, so, so, so now we will talk about what are the things that are happening, the event that have taken, that will take place in the post-synaptic neuron. Once the neurotransmitter is released from the presynaptic neuron, so this is the presynaptic neuron here, it's released in the, from this end, that's the synapse, and once it's released and binds with specific receptor, this is the post-synaptic neuron, okay. Now, what are the events that will be produced in this post-synaptic neuron? We told that once the receptor goes binds a specific receptor in the post-synaptic neuron, this neuron gets activated and there will be, sorry, this receptor presents in the neuron get activated and there will be ultimately generation of action potential. Okay? That's what I told you. But just look at this. So now you think this is the synapse and the impulse, the nerve impulse or the action potential travels here, reach the end. And here it will release the neurotransmitter. It can be it can be acetylcholine, it can be dopamine, it can be serotonin, and so on. And once they go binds to its specific receptor, I'm repeating again, they will produce some potential. Okay, so once the goes binds with the receptor, receptor get activated, and once the receptor get activated, there will be an influx, there will be entry of sodium ion. That leads to the depolarization. So if you think the normal resting membrane potential is around 60 minus 65 millivolt, and because of the entry of sodium ion, now you see the depolarization, and there is generation of potential, and that potential is often called in this case is EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential, and the magnitude of excitatory postsynaptic potential can depend on how much the neurotransmitter is released. If the more neurotransmitter is released, you might see much bigger peak. Okay? If the amount of neurotransmitter release is very low, then you may get a smaller peak. So now if you can distinguish between action potential versus EPSP, excited post synaptic potential, there are some fundamental difference. So in case of action potential, that's primarily caused by the sodium voltage gated sodium channel and they follow strictly all or none law. If the potential is to threshold value, then only neurons fire, otherwise they don't fire. So all or none law is not valid in case of generation of EPSP. EPSP generation is completely dependent, uh, the magnitude of EPSP is dependent on the amount of neurotransmitter that is released. In this case, the neurotransmitter is actually bound with specific receptor and that lead to the generation of action potential. On the other hand, in case of action potential, that lead to generation of EPSP. But in case of action potential, it is the voltage gated sodium channel that's primarily involved. Okay, so if you look at the various neurotransmitters, I told you in the red color one, the all are excited in neurotransmitter they can lead to the formation of EPSP. So they can be glutamate, they can be dopamine, they can be serotonin, and they could be acetylcholine. So now let's look at what are the ionic event. So this, this is just a explanation of EPSP. What are the ionic event that can take place during EPSP? So this is just think this is the neurotransmitter when it goes and binds with its receptor. This is a neurotransmitter receptor when it goes and binds there's influx of sodium ion. 
that means the inner side of the membrane get a more and more positive charge so membrane become depolarized and that leads to the generation of epsp so in this case the potential actually is called change of potential called hypopolarization so depolarization is have a different name and in this case it is called hypopolarization and it can be gradient because different level of neurotransmitter can have different level of hypopolarization so it's a gradient potential okay so the fundamental thing is because of the entry of the sodium ion you have epsp okay so now this is just opposite one so if the neurotransmitter is gaba gamma amino butyric acid or glycine so they are inhibitory neurotransmitter so at the end if the excitation or the axon potential bond reached if it releases the inhibitory neurotransmitter and once those receptor those neurotransmitter goes and binds with specific receptor present in the postsynaptic neuron that could lead to the activation of those receptor and the receptor activation actually causes entry of chloride ion you have to remember in this case in case of ips uh, sorry in case of inhibitory neurotransmitter once they binds to its receptor and once the receptor get activated there is a entry of chloride ion so you understand inside your membrane is negative charge and there is more entry of chlorine chloride ion so that means your inside of your membrane is become more and more negative and that phenomena is called ipsp inhibitory post synaptic potential okay so just opposite of epsp so this can be found in case of inhibitory neurotransmitter like gaba and glycine so this is the ionic event that i already mentioned so once glutamate sorry once gaba or glycine binds to its specific receptor then the chloride ion goes in and potassium ion go come out and because of the entry of the chloride ion the inner side of the membrane become more and more negative and that lead to the phenomenon called ipsp and in this case it is causing more hyperpolarization because more and more negative charge in the postsynaptic neuron that's the fundamental basis of ipsp inhibitory post synaptic potential and that's where you see entry of chloride ion okay so now we talked about two different kinds of neurotransmitter one group of neurotransmitter that are excitatory there is another group of neurotransmitter which is inhibitory we have also told that the goes and bounds to their specific receptor present in the postsynaptic membrane so these are the receptor types so the receptor types also can be classified into two groups so one group of receptor which are actually channel whatever example we have shown they are actually channel so the group of receptor the receptor that are channels or you can say ligand gated channels ligand here is the neurotransmitter once the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor and activate the channel they are called ligand gated channel they are called in collectively called all ligand gated channels are collectively called ionotropic receptor because, because they are permeable to ions it can be cations it can be anions in case of epsp it's a cation in case of ipsp it's the anion okay so there are another type of uh receptors neurotransmitter receptor also present we never talked about it that's called metabotropic so they are typically you see this is the metabotropic receptor this is also present in the membrane and they are typically linked with called a specific protein called g protein they are called g protein coupled receptor so one of the fundamental difference between these two type of receptor is of course the receptor structure is different the other things is because the ionotropic receptor are permeable to ion can be cation or anion their action is very very rapid while the metabotropic receptor actually works quite slow okay i told you the g protein coupled receptor it has a unique character it has a, one of the unique character that is actually a unique seven transmembrane domain you don't have to remember all those details just remember 
neurotransmitter receptor can be categorized into two groups one group is called ionotropic type other type is called metabotropic type ionotropic types are channel metabotropic types are g protein carbon receptor and that's enough okay so now so we will be talking about uh, we talked about the discovery of the first neurotransmitter that's acetylcholine and that time we told acetylcholine is the only neurotransmitter that actually took part in the transmission not only the synaptic some synaptic transmission but also act as a neurotransmitter in the neuromuscular junction so now we'll talk about the structure and the transmission of nerve impulse in the nerve muscle junction so i think this is a nerve this is a nerve that is innervated to your muscles suppose you want to move your hand your muscle actually contracts in your hand the skeletal muscle present in your hand actually that's the skeletal muscle present in your hand the skeletal muscles actually innervated with with different sensory nerve also motor nerves and this junction the nerve muscle junction actually actually if you look at the higher magnification image in that junction actually the acetylcholine play very important role as a neurotransmitter just think so once that the axonal potential travels the end of the neuron to the nerve muscle junction it releases acetylcholine from the vesicles acetylcholine cross that gap that's called synaptic cleft and binds with specific receptor acetylcholine receptor present in the muscle so in case of neuromuscular junction it is the muscle well we gave other example during our, earlier we talked about post synaptic neuron so in case of nerve muscle junction the post synaptic neuron can be replaced by the muscle so the receptor present in the muscle and once acetylcholine binds to its specific receptor in the muscle there will be generation of action potential and that can lead to the contraction of the muscle this is mentioned here briefly so acetylcholine released from the nerve terminals binds to its receptor in the muscle generate action potential then the muscle contracts now the interesting thing is the receptor that present in in in, in skeletal muscle you have to remember the skeletal muscle which is present in your hand legs like this area the receptor types is often called nicotinic type so nicotinic type of acetylcholine receptor is present in the skeletal muscle and it is a cation channel it's a channel so it's ionotropic type of receptor so on simplistic terms so nicotinic type of acetylcholine receptor is a ionotropic type of receptor why the name nicotinic came because the nicotine which is present in the tobacco is actually agonist of this receptor so nicotine binds with this kind of receptor present in the muscle and can act as a agonist it can mimic the function of acetylcholine that's why the name nicotinic okay so you can understand people who smokes tobacco can actually cause its activation of the nicotinic type of receptor in the muscle skeletal muscle Now very interesting things you must all heard about the cobra king cobra snake right and we know also the venom of king cobra is very very poisonous so if it bites you might die and the question comes how what is the how, what it actually consists in the venom and how it works so here's an example the king cobra snake venom actually have small peptides small peptides you know what is peptide and that peptide actually strongly binds with nicotinic type of acetylcholine receptor that is present in your skeletal muscle is a irreversible blocker okay when it goes binds to this receptor present in the muscles in the, i mean skeletal muscles it's very difficult to ask up so once it goes and binds it block the transmission in the nerve muscle junction so which ultimately leads to the paralysis of the muscle And that's how you can die. Okay, so now we got list explanation how cobra snake venom actually can block neurotransmission in the skeletal muscle, the muscle junction. Okay, in the skeletal muscle. Okay, here's another example. 
Although acetylcholine acts as a neurotransmitter in your skeletal muscle, it also acts as a neurotransmitter in your heart muscle. But the mode of action is just different. First thing you note, the acetylcholine actually causes, release of acetylcholine actually causes formation of axon potential in the skeletal muscles and thereby muscle contracts. So acetylcholine causes contraction of your skeletal muscle. On the other hand, the acetylcholine in the heart actually causes relaxation of the heart muscles. Just an opposite effect. The same neurotransmitter doing completely having completely opposite effect depending on the muscle type. In skeletal muscle, it's causing contraction, while his heart muscle is causing relaxation, and because of the relaxation, it can cause the slower of the heartbeat. Okay. Then question comes, how, why is it so different? Same neurotransmitter, why the mode of action is different? Difference came because of the receptor type. I told you, in the skeletal muscle, the acetylcholine receptor type is nicotinic, which is inotropic type. In other words, it's a channel. While the acetylcholine receptor that present in your heart muscle is actually muscarinic type. Or in other words, it is a metabotropic type, the slower type, which is G-protein coupled linked receptor. Okay. The muscarinic type name came again is because of the, the poison, the muscarine actually present in this kind of mushroom. So the muscarine is the chemicals that is present in this beautiful mushroom. And if you consume this mushroom, you can be dead. So why you will be dying? Because the, the chemicals muscarine that actually goes, binds with the specific receptor, acetylcholine receptor, that's present in your heart and mimic the action of acetylcholine. You have to remember, it can potentiate the action of acetylcholine in the heart. So at the end, what do you expect? Acetylcholine itself causes relaxation of the heartbeat, which means heartbeat will slow down. And your mascarine is much more potent than acetylcholine. It does the same job. So too much of mascarine then can lead to the slower, slowing of the heartbeat, and at the end, your heartbeat might totally stop. If you consume large amount of mascarine, your heartbeat might just stop, which means you're dead. So now you clearly understood. So acetylcholine's mode of action in the skeletal muscle and the heart has differed quite opposite because the type of receptor present in the heart is a nicotinic type, which is channel, Type of receptor present, acetylcholine receptor present in the heart is metabotropic type, or you can say it's mascarinic type. In case of acetylcholine receptor present in the skeletal muscle, the nicotine is actually agonist, and in case of uh, acetylcholine receptor present in the heart, mascarine is the agonist, while snake venom is a irreversible blocker of nicotinic type of acetylcholine receptor. I hope this is clear to you guys. So this is one of the area where you could expect questions. Okay. But at least for your understanding, it should be very clear how snake venom, cobra snake venom actually can work and paralyze your muscle. On the other hand, you should be also well aware, aware about when you consume mushroom, be sure you don't take this poisonous mushroom. By looking at the figures, you can understand the colorful mushrooms. Never ever consume such mushroom. They could be deadlier. Okay, that's one of the take home message. So this kind of mushrooms, usually you'll find out some jungle. Even you can find out in IIT some jungle. So never think to consume this kind of mushroom. Okay. Well, now let's discuss about another types of uh, synapse. That's a glutaminergic synapse. So this glutaminergic synapse mostly present in your, in, your, in your brain and they are playing a very, very important role in the formation of the memory. So in this case, in the basic 
flow of the transmission is pretty same. Only difference is that the neurochemicals that is stored, neurotransmitter that is stored in the synaptic vesicle is the glutamate or aspartate sometimes. So once the aspartate or glutamate is released from the presynaptic end, it will go binds to a specific type of receptor and then produces event or produces action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. The receptor types again in this case have two different types as mentioned during case of acetylcholine is anotropic type like NMDA, AMPA, kinate. You have to remember some of these names, okay? Because they are primarily involved in learning and memory formation. And there are also metabotropic type, which is G-protein coupled. So there are different kinds of m glua M stands for metabotropic. There are different kinds of m glua So I'm not talking about that. But at least remember NMDA, AMPA, and at least these two. They are primarily involved in memory formation. So I told you the basic flow of neurotransmission is pretty same. Okay. The only there are certain special features that I have not mentioned here in case of uh, NMDA receptor mediated synaptic transmission because they play a very important role in learning and memory. They have extra layer of control. So I'm not talking about that. So they are actually regulated by multiple ways. Other than this basic flow, they are actually regulated by various ions, various, uh, various amines, there's our oxidative and reduction states, and so on. So forget about all those, but at least remember this NMDA and AMPA type of ionotropic receptor are playing a very important, plays a very important role in the formation of uh, uh, memory. Other than that, if this kind of neurotransmission uh, in this kind of synapse, if there is an overactivation, if this kind of synapse are constantly active, that might ultimately land up to the death of these neurons. That actually happens during epilepsy, epileptic seizure, or sometimes during stroke. So now we understand, although this glutaminergic synapse play a very, very important role in learning and memory formation, the overactivation of this pathway can also be detrimental and that can lead to the death of the neuron and this kind of phenomenon occurs during stroke or during epileptic seizure. Another thing, important thing is to tell you, I would remember that glutaminergic synapse transmissions are one of the most fastest neurotransmission. If you compare all those different kinds of neurotransmission, you heard about acetylcholine, you heard about dopamine, serotonin. So if you compare among all those, the glutaminergic synapse are much more faster than any other neurotransmission. And uh, this is something different, okay? So this actually tells you, in the beginning slide, we told you hippocampus is one of the place in your brain that actually store all, and some kinds of memory, okay? Most kind of cementing memory. The study that you do, those kind of memory actually store a specific part of the brain that's called hippocampus. Why the name hippo, you can easily understand. Okay. Now this is an interesting story. In psychology book, you might name, you might find this terminology called HM. HM stands for his name actually is the patient, the Henry Molaisa. It's often widely known as HM. Why is so famous is actually this guy actually showed a kind of epileptic seizure and his doctor actually tried to did, I mean, tried to do some surgery eh? and in such a way that actually doctor removed some part of his brain I mean to, to kind of cure the surgery, yeah, cure the epilepsy and the doctor precisely removed the part of the hippocampus. When doctor did, he was not realized that time that how precisely he did that surgery. Anyway, after the surgery, the, the guy HM was perfectly fine. His actually epileptic seizure actually vanished. So he was recovered from the problem that he was having. But the new problem that came is completely, completely unexpected even to the doctor. That is, he is, uh, his um, the ability to form new memory was completely lost. Okay, he survived quite a long time after this and he was the subject to study how the specific part of a brain I mean that's hippocampus is actually involved in learning and memory. So this patient subject actually gave lots of information about how 
memory is stored in hippocampus. Okay, so that's very wonderful and it's very interesting. And actually, ultimately, his study, I mean, study from his brain, clearly tells, is written here, hippocampus is essential for making memories. And if we lose both of them, say both of these five the hippocampus, we will suffer a global loss of memory that often called amnesia. If you look at the internal structure, microscopic view, this is the part of the hippocampus. There, if you just do a coronal section, I explained you earlier, like this way, if you cut, you can see like this, this is the architecture. Okay, that's the structure of the hippocampus and it has a different part. This is called dented gyrus, CA3, CA2, CA1 and so on. So if you are interested, you can study in more details in the textbook. Okay. So this is just a summary about uh, memory storage and recall. So memories are encoded in the form of new synapses and circuits. It's very important. The new protein must be synthesized during memory formation. Circuits involved in formation of memory and recalling memory are might be same or might be different. This is still under research. And one of the guy who is pioneer in this field is Susumu Tanegawa who got Nobel Prize, it's very interesting, he got Nobel Prize for his pioneering work in immunology. He was actually involved in discovering the antibody diversity. So you must have heard in immunology class. But now he completely shifted his research area to the brain science and he's one of the pioneers to, to find out whether, whether memory formation and recalling memory might be same or different. You could look at literature and find out. There are a lot of hot paper from his lab come out. And some of them are saying that, uh, that the circuit involved in memory formation and recalling memory might be the same or partly same. And this is the last part is that different memories are stored in different interconnected brain regions. It's not the hippocampus only is responsible for storing memory. There's other part of the brain like amygdala which actually stores emotional memory. So on. Uh, so now I'll just introduce uh, one of a uh, famous Indian neuroscientist who is actually currently present in MIT, USA. This is Professor Megang Sur, and we'll be very excited to to see his background education. So he, he actually received B.Tech degree from electrical engineering IIT Kanpur. I think, I think, I think that's actually can motivate many of you how being an engineering student, he could make your career in some of the exciting area of biological science. And this would be very, very inspiration for any of you. Okay. Okay. No, 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 let's switch back to the subject. So we talked about uh, glutaminergic synapse, which actually release uh, glutamate or aspartate as a neurotransmitter uh, in the synapse. And that took part primarily in, in, in memory formation and in formation of long-term potentiation and, and memory. And I also told you the excessive activation of glutaminergic synapse actually can and kill those neurons and that kind of problem can be seen when a patient, a epileptic patient shows constant seizure or, or, or on other conditions like, like during stroke. Okay. So now you think in the other side. So just think when there is an excitatory system in your brain that can lead to excitation, you have to think how to control that excitation and you must, I mean, to control that excitation, you must need an opposite system. So what I'm telling you is, if there is a system that can lead to excitation and if you have to control precisely that excitation, you must need to have a system that can try to control it. So, so that's, that's actually inhibitory system. Okay. So to precisely control your all the activities, coordinated, just think coordinated movement balance, excitation 
must be controlled precisely. So for that, you must need another system, another controlling system, and that's the Gavarji system. So in this case, the transmission is pretty same. The only difference that you will be seeing here is the neurotransmitter. And in this case, when the axon potential travels in the piece of the neuron end, the vesicles that are present here can release inhibited neurotransmitters. And I mentioned you the inhibited neurotransmitter could be glycine, could be GABA. So they can go, release, binds with the specific receptor. I mentioned also you once they go, binds with the receptor and activate the receptor, there will be entry of chloride ion. Okay? And because of the entry of chloride ion, there will be more and more negative charge that leads to high power polarization. Thereby, this neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, can be inhibited. Okay? So that's the fundamental mechanism the Gavarji system does. Okay? So now, so I told you, so what's the basic or fundamental role of Gavarji system in your brain to fine tune, to finely control your, your excitatory system so that you can maintain the optimum balance. That's the, that's the physiological role does. But we could, we could exploit this system in multiple ways. Like it's showing here, most of the anesthetics that today we use, I, I already gave an example of, 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 of inhibition of voltage-gated sodium channel. But there are many other anesthetics that today is used for anesthetize during surgery are actually stimulate the function or mimic the function of your GABA receptor. So there, is, there will be more, so, so, so those agents actually can cause more and more inhibition which ultimately leads to the stop or, or stop of the or slow down of the propagation of action potential thereby thereby it can slow I mean it can it can even uh, shut down the activity of the postsynaptic neuron okay so now other than that the reduced activity of the GABA receptor can also cause seizure or uh, a seizure in epilepsy so you can understand the optimum balance and if the inhibitory neurons are not functioning properly, that's what I mentioned here, if there is an abnormal function of GABA receptor, you could have more and more excitation and that can be found during seizure in epilepsy, epileptic patient. Okay. Well, so now we'll introduce another very interesting aspect of our brain function that's called reward function okay so our brain actually have a specific reward pathways specific reward circuitry that involves various parts of your brain parts of our brain you really don't have to remember that the different parts is mentioned here but just think our brain has a specific reward pathway, reward circuitry that involves different parts of our brain. And what this pathway does, so, so by name you can easily understand that the reward pathway is mentioned here are responsible for reward related memory, pleasure, motivation, desire, so on. And the neurotransmitter that are primarily involved in reward pathway, reward signaling is the dopamine. Okay, that's very important you have to remember. So reward pathway, during reward activation of reward pathway, the neurotransmitter that is released is called dopamine, primarily dopamine. And there's another aspect is today most of the drugs of abuse, most of the abuse drug that people use are actually working, are actually some way modulate the function of our reward circuitry. So you must have heard many such abuse drugs like cocaine, amphetamine, I'm sure all of you heard probably heroin, LSD, cannabis, and so on. 
Okay, so so most of the abuse drug, I'm repeating again, works by modulating the reward pathways. Now, first to think why our brain should have such a reward pathways. What could be its physiological significance? Okay. What it does in normal circumstances. So now I'll give you the best example. Just think, you all actually have uh, cracked IDJ advanced exam, and because of that, you are here. So now think, the moment you heard your your result first, that you 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 got rank within say some thousand, and your feeling at that moment, that can be, I mean, you can easily understand. That can be termed as a reward, and during that time, actually, you, you you feel intense pleasure, happiness. In other way, we have another terminology to explain that. That's called euphoria. I'll show in the next slide. So euphoria means intense or extensive pleasure and happiness. Okay, I I, I think that's you'll never forget, right? So the, so I just give you one example. But in your life, you might have several such instances where you naturally feel intense happiness, pleasure. And during that time, this is the brain circuitry that are heavily involved. I hope that's clearly understood for you guys. Now, think about the drug abusers. So what that does to get that instant happiness or instant or intensive pleasure, they use this drug of abuse. Just think, take example of heroin. So the, if the drug you just take heroin, heroin can produce pretty similar kind of effects. So they can activate this reward pathway and thereby you can feel pleasure, happiness and whatever uh, you want. But the problems of drug abusers is, is once you start taking that, probably you all know, it actually causes a cyclical problem. You today start one cigarette, then two cigarettes, three cigarettes, like this, and then at some point you reach a, a saturation stage. And when 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 you can't really control, it's uncontrollable, and when you want to stop it, then there is a problem. So what is actually does it. So if you're constantly taking a drug of abuse, you have to understand your reward pathway is constantly activated. And that actually leads at some point a complete change of your circuitry in these areas. So so if you take a drug of abuse, say for a one month or two month, some of the hardware component, if I say this way, it is now completely changed, which means you are a completely different person. Okay? And at that point, if your family member says, oh, you have to stop it, now you will end up with a different kind of problem. And that in, in, in medical jargon, it's called drug withdrawal problem. Okay? You just can't stop the drug of abuse. Once you stop, because you know that your, 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 your hardware is completely changed. Your circuitry is completely changed. And adjust it with a very higher dose of, say, drugs of abuse, heroin, or cocaine. And now you suddenly want to stop. And that's not possible. So there is a way to do it. I told you, if you instantly stop, you will end up with a completely opposite kind of symptoms. And that's often called drug withdrawal symptoms. So you, you need different way to control it. Okay, you don't have to go for details, but just be careful about this. Very, very, you have to well understood the drug abuse works through this pathway. And if you repeatedly use that drugs of abuse, it can completely change your brain circuitry. So have to be very, very careful. Okay. And one of the important things you have to remember the use the, the drugs of abuse in, in young age, the age like you is much much more dangerous than in the older age because this age your brain is highly highly plastic 
That's another area. I will not be able to talk about that much more details, but just a brief remember your brain is highly, highly plastic when you are in early age. As you get older, your plasticity actually reduces. And because of the high plasticity in your brain, the drugs of abuse for a few days can cause a rapid change of circuitry in your brain. Okay? And that's going to be very, very difficult to correct, even if you want to stop. Okay? So you should be very, very careful about that. So now I'll just give you one of the popular example drugs of abuse. That's cannabis, very commonly used. Okay, and I am sure most of you probably heard this name. So this is the cannabis trees. You can see the the, the, the active gradient or active principle or the, 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 the problem, the chemicals that present in this plant in cannabis that actually name is here mentioned uh, cannabinoids. Okay. So the cannabinoids present in the cannabis that often people use as a drugs of abuse and that also can activate your reward pathway that I showed you earlier slide and thereby you could feel intense happiness and pleasure and that's I mentioned here euphoria which means intense pleasure or happiness. Okay, It's very very commonly used and this actually works this this cannabinoids which is present in this plant and they can activate I told you the reward pathway and the, 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 the molecular basis is they actually works through this cannabinoid receptor if you collect we've talked about neurotransmitter receptor are two types one is channel anotropic and the other is metabotropic so this receptor is metabotropic type and one of the very very interesting thing is that in your brain actually is highly highly enriched with cannabinoid receptor this cannabinoid receptor is present almost every parts of your brain and many of the reasons i mean why this cannabinoid receptor is present so high level in our brain we, we still don't know what could be its physiological significance but one of the uh, one of the reasons could be when there is injury or whenever you want, like I explained to you what could the physiological significance of, of uh, reward circuitry, pretty same way you can explain. Probably whenever reward pathway get activated or whenever there is an internal problem, internal injury in our brain, probably our body secretes sometimes the natural molecules, the molecules like uh, cannabinoids. So in this case, people have find out there is a kind, there's kind of molecules called anandamides which actually secretes by our body. You have to remember. So this, this plant actually have a molecule that's called cannabinoids. Okay. While our body produces pretty similar kind of molecules that's called anandamides. Okay. And these anandamides might be produced in your body under different circumstances. When you feel like, like when you crack your, I gave example IITJ exam. And when you first hear about that, that moment, with a lot of anandamides, it's secreted in your brain. Or when there's internal injury in your brain, you may not be knowing, but body can sense. And because of that, your body can release this kind of molecule, okay, and thereby can help. So there's two things it can touch. Whenever somebody takes uh, scannabinoids, of course, one thing you can th think that it helps or it, it actually causes intense happiness or pleasure. But in other things it does is actually a relief the pain. Your body ache, body pain actually reduced, dramatically reduced by these drugs, this kind of molecules. Okay. But the same thing actually even, even you can find out when somebody uh, uh, or what you call take uh, opiates, opium, poppy. You must have heard about opium poppy. So pretty same way it works like, like cannabis. Okay. So, so one of the active ingredients present in opium poppy is called morphine. It's often used to, to treat, uh, I mean, heavy pain. Okay. When the, somebody feels extensive pain, normal pain medicine don't work. Sometimes people use morphine to relieve the pain. But the same way, this cannabis also can help to reduce pain. Okay. 
but most important thing you have to remember what is the physiological significance of 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 this kind of receptor okay cannabinoid receptor that present in your body or or in other way reward circuitry that present in your body what is their normal function just i gave you a few example but it can be many more such example whenever you feel any kind of happiness pleasure this kind of pathway get activated so you think you just understand your brain instantly i mean is built up with such kind of system to give you pleasure happiness is not amazing anyway so there are something else i'll just i'll finish with this uh, so during your i i mean just i mentioned the anandamide so i told you during the injury internal injury in your brain or in other parts of your body this kind of chemicals can be reduced be released other than that it can also be produced or released by neuron during when you laugh when you do exercise when you smile so those kind of instance cases those kind of cases you might be also able to see release of anandamides or similar kind of molecules okay now just to give you another example so you all take this medicine this is mentioned here paracetamol when you get fever or body ache doctor often prescribe this is very very commonly used uh, medicine to relieve your pain or to to reduce your fever but what you don't know <laughs> is this paracetamol actually activates cannabinoid receptor and thereby can helps to relieve pain okay so now we understand how a paracetamol can helps to relieve pain okay so that's i think all about uh, whatever uh, your course content in this brain structure and function if you would like to know much more details definitely you should go and read more books just give us some of the books like here uh, this is the this is the very very nice test book written in very simplistic manner definitely you should consult this book other than that uh, there is this is actually available freely the brain fact this is actually published by society for neuroscience usa you can get from their website and it's freely available okay other than that i'll suggest you guys to read this this is a kind of science fiction book story book phantoms in the brain this is written by another indian doctor v s ramachandran if you are interested you must read you will be really amazed to read this book and other than that you can also just look at uh, youtube which some of the youtube lecture it's a wonderful lecture okay so don't miss that you try to try to try to listen some of his talk and just to mention that there are many countries now invested huge huge amount of money to understand different circuitry of the brain as in, in at the beginning slide i mentioned how the circuitry is linked with specific type of behavior so you can think that the countries various countries have a very specific brain related project and the china's big brain project is one of the most heavily funded project recently so i'm sure many of you probably land up your career as i told you in this uh, uh, exciting field of biological science so thank you i hope you will enjoy this uh, lecture series